So understanding the power of fasting and prayer, part three. If you missed part one and part two, we do have those archived at experienceimpactchurch.com. And, uh, and you know what, I just want to just give a shout out to just all of our sound team. Again, even though they're not good looking. Um, <laughs> Um, everybody that just, you know, does so much for the church and, you know, and, and there's just so many that do things even behind the scenes. Thank you. Thank you for loving God, loving his people. And, um, and I'm not talking just, you know, making coffees or making booklets. Thank you, Julie. I mean, uh, or, or doing hospitality, you know, Tony, Brian, and, you know, and just every, everything. Just, um, you know, for those of you that even support the church, you know, uh, through your tithes and just your prayers. And thank you. Thank you. God says thank you. This is his. So we want to bless him as he has blessed up us. And, um, and you guys have just been just, uh, God has just got us and, and, and we're just just beginning. That's the crazy thing. We're just beginning. So um, so part three, again, get, get part one, part two. There's kind of a building to that that happens. Um, and, and I'm not sure with some of you it's not intentional. I, I don't if I do a series that's something intentional, I'll let you know up front. But any of the series you've ever heard from me in the four years, the four little years we've been in existence so far, they have been series that have been put together by the Holy Spirit uh, through just what he puts on my heart. Um, but physical obedience brings about spiritual victory. And uh, the crazy, crazy thing is one of the first titles I had for this particular day was Excuses of the Slacker. Because there's so many excuses that I, as you go through, you know, listening to different people doing fasting on YouTube and, you know, different people in my past and stuff, there's different excuses that are given. And I believe a lot of times excuses are given for fasting because people weren't taught right. There's a lot of churches that don't teach fast. There's a lot of churches that don't teach about hell. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know that? I'm sorry, it's in my Bible. What's going to get talked about? Because we're supposed to pay attention. And that's what's going to help us to grow even closer to God. So whether it be we're teaching about hell or whether it be we're teaching about fasting, God wants us to know his heart. Amen? Amen. So I think we need to pay attention. And, uh, and, and be careful. There, anything that you might come up with in your head, and you may not have, you know, audibly say it when it comes to fasting. Anything that you would call an excuse, I will tell you right now. And then there's different types of fasting, and I'm really excited because we got our whole thing. I promise you guys we got that. Which, um, if I can get a couple of deacons uh, that aren't walking the hallways <laughs> to come up and let's pass out some of these fasting guys. I'm going to grab one here. And uh, how many do we have, Julie? I think there's 50 there. I think there's 50, 50 here. Somewhere in that okay, so whoever. A, first, whoever's going to be embarking on a, on a fast, okay, we're going to be doing a 21-day fast from February 20th, corporately as a church, to March 13th, okay? So definitely get this guy. But for somebody that's curious, then ask the one, okay? There's good stuff in here, and this is 50% customized by the Holy Spirit for me, Okay? So as soon as you get that, just start, you know, perusing through that. And this is yours. And as they're passing those out, and my, my biggest goal, personally, and I recognize it, that, that we have a mix of people in our church body, as there are many church bodies of this size, of people that have never fasted, never attempted it, some that have maybe didn't follow through. Others that haven't you know, followed through all the way. So we have different experience levels or lack of thereof. So this was really important for us to put together so that we are right now, and, and as I said, this is something that I needed to prepare myself. I, I have done a number of fasts in my past with different churches and, um, and personally and so forth. Um, but I am—I can't tell you how excited I am about this one. 
for so many reasons. One, because of you guys. I'm getting feedback, and you guys are just, you're getting so excited, you know, and it, it excites me. And I'm a bad guy to get excited because, man, you get me stoked. <laughs> and, and I used to get on fire for, for, you know, for God moving even more. You know, and it's it's just watching what the Holy Spirit is doing through God's people. And then we should be excited. Not excited that we're going to be starving, and not that you necessarily are, because again, there's different fasts, okay? And, um, you know, so, you know, just preparing is a big thing. So, you know, as you look at that first inner page, everybody get one that's going to be, you know, doing it. Okay, and I would you know, just look through all that at your leisure, um, you know, and there's health notes in there. You know, you don't, don't, you know what, don't be foolish, amen? Don't be foolish and do something that's going to hurt yourself, okay? I'm not going to suffer and endorse that. Um, you know, and then, then when you look over on, and we talked about this last week, the last page, where right in front of the journal, the, the journey journal, okay, that last page, the types of fasts, you'll see particularly the top three, the normal fast is no food, water only. So really, water, ice chips, gum. Because you, you do get parched, and, and, and you know, gum just is helpful. And it's no sugar gum. And one thing I did right here should have, uh, use xylitol gum. Okay? Mentos brand, M-E-N-T-O-S. You've seen that at the checkout out of there at Walmart or Giant Eagle. Mentos has pure xylitol. Don't do the try that. It's a mix of sucralose and xylitol. They put the xylitol, tiny bit of xylitol in there just to, to make you think it's all xylitol. Um, and xylitol is nothing, nothing. It's not a sugar. It's, it's a natural sugar that comes from corn cob or birch bark. It's a carbon six sugar. Um, everything else sugar was is a carbon five sugar. And what that means is a carbon six sugar actually is completely natural and is very, very good periodontially. And uh, there was a study done in a third world country um, with xylitol and the mothers and the children all getting cavities. And uh, they was giving the mother, not the kids with cavities, but the mother some xylitol gum and was monitoring her. And well, there were many of them, it was you know, a bigger study. And they noticed about an 80% decrease in periodontal disease with xylitol being used. And it was interesting because the same percentage decrease was happening to the children, um, and they weren't chewing the gum because cavities are contagious. If you have a cavity and you kiss somebody, you get a cavity or a bacteria. The body deals with it a lot of times, but if your body's immune system isn't balanced, then you can also get that same bacteria do things you know, to your teeth or to your body if you don't want where you can get sick as well. Okay? So anyways, all that is to say that xylitol is a good gum to use when you're doing the water fast only. The absolute fast, that is no water, no food, and there's a huge disclaimer there in red. <laughs> do not do that until you talk to me. Do not do that until you talk to your doctor. Do not do that until you first and foremost talk to God. Seriously, if you, if you absolutely feel led that God is leading you that way, talk with me and we'll pray and then we just want to make sure it's not you. You know, it's being all rambunctious, you know, and then and I will say, you know what, you know, do we need to talk to your doctor? Well, no food, no water for three days, that's something you take seriously, okay? Um, and that's a rare type of a fast. Um, the partial fast, the third one there, this could be fasting certain meals of the day or abstaining from certain kinds of foods, no meat, sweets, soup only, fruit and vegetables only. Um, we see in Daniel chapter 10, you know, 10 um, Daniel 8, no pleasant bread, as it says. So that's where a lot of people can absolutely do a Daniel fast. And you're, you're, here's, the, here's the question I thought coming here this morning. If you were stuck on an island, what, were the, what are the top three things that you'd want to eat? Okay. Jeffrey? Okay. Eliminate them. Oh, no, I'm going to starve on the island! <laughs> For 21 days, eliminate the top three things. Assume that wasn't your anchovies and broccoli and spinach. Okay? So, and that, so, and I had people at first say, oh, I can't go any for 21 days. And if there's hypo or hyperglycemia, you can do fine on an annual fast. You're just making sure that you're, you're tapping into purposefully 
You're starving the flesh to feed the spirit. Amen? Amen. If you're not starving the flesh to feed the spirit, you're going to know within the first 72 hours. Okay? And so I'm saying there's a purposeful, you know, uh, process here. So and then you'll see the other fast there too, the juice fast. The corporate fast, this is what we're doing right now, a church or a group of people who feel God has called them to fast together for a certain period of time. And I'm also later in the message here going to talk about a certain purpose as well as many churches do corporately. And then the Jewish fast and, and so forth. Okay? Um, and then the one that I really like at the bottom of that page, fasting and abstinence. And I pointed this out before, but I pointed it out again, although the word fast is used as abstaining from food in the Bible and does not refer to giving up other things. During a fast, one can practice abstinence from other pleasures as well, such as entertainment, TV, hobbies, sex, as it's you know, talked about there in 1 Corinthians. So there's different things that we can do that we know we're abstaining from pleasurable things of the flesh for a spiritual feeding time. And if this is completely foreign to you, I will promise you, from somebody that has done partial fast, I've cheated on fast, but the fast that I would go full force into, gung-ho, let the Holy Spirit lead me. I'm not leading me. I'm letting the Holy Spirit lead me, right? That's where I saw God's power come in and the breakthroughs, things that I never thought that would have happened, things that I've been praying for sometimes years in a couple of my fast. I watched God break through, okay? So you think about anything in your life that you're dealing with that you need a breakthrough. Pay attention. Pay attention. All right, so hopefully those guys help. And uh, there might be some things in there. You might have ideas of the guys for, you know, maybe a next uh, revision, which maybe we should keep track of those revisions, Julie, just in case we need to add another page. You know, you never know. So anyway, so that's, uh, that's uh, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, so we've been touching on something particularly um, in our first two parts of this series. Um, and, it's, and it's a serious part of understanding fasting. And today we're going to give some more attention, okay? So this is going to be a great question. What happens in the unseen world when you fast and pray? And those of you that were here last week, we kind of touched on that, didn't we? What happens in the unseen world when we fast and pray? Because we saw last week in part two of understanding the power of prayer and fasting, we saw what happens when Daniel was praying and fasting for a few reasons with his primary reason. Remember, his primary reason was to understand a vision that he had. Because remember, the book of Daniel, it's, it's, it's very ap apocalyptic. There's visions given there. We need to pay attention to that when we're reading you know, Revelations and and we're here on Wednesday evenings, you know, doing end time studies. But we saw the angel Gabriel, and, 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 and really recognized that Gabriel's name isn't mentioned, but in the Hebrew, Gabriel means the Lord is my strength. And in that moment, Daniel needed that. So a lot of theologians, if not most of them, recognized this was Gabriel. Okay? So we saw the angel Gabriel, um, he was dispersed. We saw he was dispersed. To bring an answer to Daniel's prayer as Daniel was fasting and praying. Right? We saw that. But what happened to Gabriel? He was held up. He was held up. And it wasn't a robbery. <laughs> <laughs> he was held up by an evil force called the Prince of Persia, which I didn't point this out last week, um, but, but that, this makes sense. Because the divine answer that Gabriel was trying to bring, Daniel, had to do with the overthrow of the Persian Empire, which today is modern Iran. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. So there we saw one biblical example of prayer and fasting causing the invisible world to respond accordingly, Right? Now, with fasting and praying, God wants us to be ready to humble ourselves like we've never been humbled before. So get the pride out, amen? There ain't no pride with prayer and fasting. 
You will not get anywhere. You will be spinning your wheels. You'll be a gerbil on, on, on his little spare school there if there's, if there's any pride in there. So humility is the first part. God wants us to understand that the power of prayer and fasting will release blessings like we've never seen before and the countering attacks as well. Okay? Jesus honors humility. Amen? In all things. Especially when we fast and pray. We see Matthew 23, verse 12. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Boy, is that simple. Man. Kind of like the first will be last and the last will be first type of teaching. You know, so we're going to look at another interesting example in God's Word this morning about how physical obedience brings about spiritual victory. How many of us want a spiritual victory? Man, I should see all those hands going up. Man, we want a spiritual victory. Um, how, how many of us have had spiritual victories? So you know how it feels. I mean, if you're sitting here this morning and you know the Lord your Savior, that's the beginning of the spiritual victory. But now, this is when the problem begins. Amen? <laughs> It is. This is when the fun begins. So there's this story in the Bible, in the book of Exodus, where Moses and the Israelites, if you remember, were, uh, were fighting the Amalekites, right? And we learn, this is awesome, we learn a profound lesson about fasting through this story. So if you remember how the story went, God told Moses to go up on the mountain and lift his hands toward heaven. I need, uh, what is happening? Hold on here. I need a prop. Uh, we don't have any props, but I gave a prop. <laughs> okay, pretend this is Moses' staff. <laughs> I don't know what it looked like exactly. <laughs> okay, so God told Moses to go up on the mountain and lift his hands toward heaven. We'll see what happens over here. Staff. Staff. Remember that, okay? So as long as Moses kept his hands lifted to heaven, his people would successfully be battling the Amalekites. Remember? But as soon as his arms went down, the children of Israel would begin to suffer loss in the battle. Remember the story? So as long as Moses hand his hands and, and as long as he had his hands in a physical posture, please hear this. As long as he had his hands in a physical posture raised to heaven in obedience to God, the Israelites would prevail in battle. You see where I'm going with this. As long as Moses had physical obedience, he would experience victory in the unseen world because of his physical obedience. See it? Let's look at it. Exodus. Chapter 17, 9 through 13. And I want to welcome all of our viewers for watching on streaming this morning. May God bless you through his word. Exodus 17, 9 through 13. Here it is. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him. And fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand. Is it singular in your Bible too? When Moses held up his hand, because the other one, he had the rod in it, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone. Can you picture this in your head? So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and her supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. Who supported their hands? <laughs> and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So then, obviously, clearly, Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And this story reinforces the fact that physical obedience can bring spiritual victory. Yeah. So, 
We can say, I mean, we can honestly say, God will win what God wants to win. We hear people say it all the time. But we see here in this particular story, and in this particular battle, by the way, do you have a particular battle? Seriously, do you have a particular battle? Plural? Do you have particular battles? We see in this particular battle that without physical obedience from Moses, keeping his hands lifted to God's throne, that the battle clearly would have been lost. Amen? We see that. I mean, Moses wasn't going to put his hands down for nothing because he saw what happened when he got tired. He saw his people losing. He put them back up and started winning. No brainer. <laughs> Amen? Amen? No brainer physical posturing. Something here we need to learn and take seriously from a Bible that we all say and know is the truth. Amen? We're going to take this so seriously. I love how God puts so many things in his word to validate other things we need to be obeyed. Amen? Amen? So this is a great biblical example of understanding that there's a connection of what we do physically and how it affects us spiritually. And we kind of alluded to it here earlier in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Amen. Therefore glorify God in your body, might I add, with your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. Amen. Which is why I will encourage now and forevermore, you know, fasting or getting away from things that is a, that, that are electronic that are pulling you down into a deep, dark hole. The gaming. What's it taking time away from? The pornography. You know, pornography in the churches. Not just our church. All churches. All churches. Because it's right. And it's not just with men. Hello. And it's also another topic that's not talked about in a lot of pulpits. You know what? You need to be aware of it wise. Husbands, have filters, check each other's cell phones. Teenagers, pay attention to your teenagers, pay attention to their phones. Is it a battle? Yeah, it's a battle. But the battle's God's. Amen. But we've got to stay in front of it. Satan has and will and will continue to use all the means he can. I would. I would. I would all, use all the means I had to take you down to a deep, dark hole so you can't ever get back out. And you can't not only not grow in Christ yourself, nobody else is going to see you grow in Christ. So they're not going to come to know who he is either. I would do if I was saying. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? This, this is a primary verse. As a pastor, you can only assume how much I've had to do, to do some religious exemptions. And, uh, you know, so this is the primary verse used by many Christians who have sought to get a religious exemption uh, for the Mufasa mandated vaccine. And, you know, and last night we were, you know, sitting at our table and, and this great conversation last night at our tables at the Valentine Bank, but I just loved it. But we're talking about how our children are not only getting indoctrinated in a public school system, and they are. They are. There's no denying that. Um, you know, so, I mean, and, and, and not everybody has, you know, chosen public school, uh, or, you know, and some do, and everybody's in a different place. Just understand the reality of the truth. Your kids are being indoctrinated in the public school system. They're not going to come out and say, hey, look at this curriculum. I have seen it, and then I saw the news yesterday. And look at this curriculum. This curriculum being hidden by the, you know, by the system from the parents. Please know that. Okay? That these kids are watching their adults' models obedience to a government system that is so corrupt. Think about this. So that when the children are adults, they'll be nothing more than an indoctrinated society of Marxist communists that truly believe that the government is there to take care of them. 
and capitalism is evil. What's this the road they're going down right now? But here's what came to my mind, and and I shared it out loud because it hit me how inundated that the private schools and the homeschooling sector has experienced. Do you know they have experienced exponential growth in the last two years? Do we know that? It's, it's obvious. Exponential growth. It's kind of like running our own business, right? In the last year. So the parents can actually take back control, even if they didn't want to. There were some that were taking control of their kids. Boy, the parents that I've talked to, they had no idea what the school system was going to their kids until they were forced to have to bring them home. And now they will not send them back to school. Because <laughs> they realize. They realize. So, now, listen. I can see some sort of twisted legislation because of the, 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 the desensitization that we've had to mandate public school education for all children. Think about it. Because there's a level of control that's being lost by the big brother, right? And grossly eliminating the parents' ability to rear their children as the government forces the new generation into civil obedience and mandates that keep the populace under the big brother's thumb. So what we do with our physical bodies will make a big difference in the unseen world. And you can see how you know, subtle, how subtle things can happen if we're not paying attention. Okay? So I'm not chasing the rabbit. <laughs> as long as Moses' arms were raised to God, the angels of heaven would advance upon the enemy. But as soon as Moses' arms would come down, the angels would withdraw and the enemy began to advance, right? Much like what we saw with Daniel when I was talking about Gabriel. You know, fighting the enemy for 21 days to, you know, when he was trying to bring Daniel an answer to his prayer. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. It's talking about angels. Are they, the angels, not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Think about that. So God releases angels into the situation, and when we fast and pray, God honors our obedience, for starters. Amen? Amen? He honors our humility, is why he talks about that. And he will honor our prayers as we have physically postured ourselves for his hand to prevail. Yes. So our corporate prayer will be that we as a church will be bold, faithful, and obedient and again, a lot of churches have their particular thing they're doing as a corporate, but here's, here's what the Lord is sending us. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Remember the last thing that Jesus told his disciples before he ascended? Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Look at, li listening to that Nick Vukasic, no arms, no legs, 500 million souls because he's being obedient and because he realized he was made that way to minister. You think God was surprised the way that guy was born? No! The man, when he was reading in John that day, as he said with his testimony, he realized He's made the way God wants him to be made so that he can do just this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. No arms, no legs. What's our excuse? Amen? Amen. What's our excuse? Teaching them, verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So let's make Matthew 18, 8, or Matthew 28, 18 our corporate prayer on February 20th. And as you search your heart and prepare for this 21 days of fasting, 
Consider the other, as I was saying earlier, consider all the other personal battles or burdens that you lift up to God. Amen? The fasting isn't just, and it can't be, it isn't just one thing to pray over. But I have always found in my Christian walk that any time I would do a, a partial fast or water fast or, or, an, or an intermittent fast, you can do that too. A lot of people do intermittent fasts. Don't eat the you know, morning and lunch and you eat dinner and you eat a, just a moderate dinner. Nothing crazy. You're not gorging yourself. Okay? But that you can also do that because that, that hunger pain, it's reminding you of food, but you set a purpose that's going to remind you of the spirit, and you're going to pray. You get hungry, you pray. You get grouse, you pray. Amen. And if you can't, if you're physically able, you get down on your knees. Yeah. That's why I'm doing this with the kids. That's why I'm doing that with the kids. So they understand they're bowing before a king. And before I started doing this, my kids, you know, we're sitting there praying, and, you know, praying, and, and then I, I, you know, I'm a father, I'm teaching them, right? So I to peek. So I'm making sure that I'm going to teach them when they're peeking. Like, no, eliminate the distractions, unless you're driving. Eliminate the distractions. You're bowing to a king. Make it simple, amen? You're on your knees. You are in a posture, amen? You're in a physical posture. When you're at home, don't, don't just bow on your knees when you're at church. We're not putting on a show. Amen? Amen. It's not a show. We don't want our kids to think we're putting on a show. We are bowing to a king. Yeah. That's serious. We're closing our eyes because we're eliminating all the distractions so we can focus on what we're saying to him and what he's saying to us. We're communing. It's so sweet. It's so sweet. Man. So let's make Matthew 28, 18 our corporate prayer. And anything else that you need to be, you know, bringing up to the Lord with your personal battles or burdens or breakthroughs, bring them into the fasting. Bring them into the praying. Amen? Nearness to God. Spiritual victory. Guidance. Those are all always part of it. Okay? The battle will be won as we obey this important biblical practice of fasting and praying. I like what Timothy says in 1 Timothy. When he talks about prayer in the church, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, he says, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Man, wrath means we're not angry. And doubting means that we're not second-guessing about praying and our physical posture. He wants us to be in. We are, we're simply obeying him humbly. Amen. Just simply obeying him humbly. And then understanding that physical obedience will bring spiritual victory every time. Amen. Every time. Yeah. Don't you dare doubt what your God can do. Yeah. Man, do we live. I get so passionate because I limited God. And he proved me wrong. Because I was being an idiot. Man, the enemy will lose the battle when we obey God. Well, that sounds pretty simple, Pastor. Yeah, <laughs> it does. Amen. Simple. The enemy will lose the battle every time when we obey our Lord and our Savior. Obedience is uncomfortable, Pastor. Yeah, it usually is. Obedience is not convenient, Pastor. <laughs> yeah, possibly. And obedience can be scary, Pastor. Yeah, yeah sometimes it can be. We have a whole list. The, 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 the big C church has diminished everything down to how we feel and what we think. You look at these mega churches, and that's usually why they're mega, because uh, narrow is the way. Yeah. Right? We want our, look, look, at, look at when we, our food, we want our grapes with no seeds. Oh, we got that now. We want our church to be a perfect temperature. How many was in here two weeks ago or three weeks ago? It was crazy, it? <laughs> we want our church to be a perfect temperature. 72 degrees is mine. What's yours? Which begs the question, what's the temperature going to be in heaven? <laughs> Think about it. We want everybody around us to know Jesus by osmosis. <laughs> and not by our mouths. About the greatest news that we can ever
ever tell somebody. We are more prone to be talking to somebody we don't even know about the weather and the Super Bowl before we ever even mention Jesus. The world is wrong with us. And when I say us, I'm talking the big C church across the globe. But I can't fast, Pastor. Fasting makes me hungry. <laughs> Fasting gives me cravings. And then, again, talking about fasting from social media. I mean, I seriously, I, I, you might be one of these, I know some people. If they fast from social media, they're probably going to go into a cold sweat or a hot flash. <laughs> I'm not being very sick. That's actually, it's, it's sad. That's sad. It's, it, it's, it's sadly funny. But it's so true. And if you're one of those, Challenge you. I'm challenging you 21 days. Not just the food. You get rid of whatever that social media thing or that cell phone thing or that game thing. 21 days. Yeah. Do it. You don't do it for me. I'm just challenging you. But you're not doing it for me. And frankly, you're not doing it for you and the end directly. We think in our head, we feel like we are humble. <laughs> so we never have to get on our knees and bow before our king just because we think in our head that we're humble. But there's a physical posturing involved. Or we think, I feel like I worship God, right, on the inside, so I don't need to physically you know, raise my hands or clap and stand. And, and you know what? When these little ones are up here, it, you know what? We're not rolling in the aisles and barking like dogs and doing all that weird stuff. You know? Not, but you know what? We are worshiping God. We're showing these kids. You know what? It's a, I mean, did you see them? I'm like, <laughs> you know? And I'm getting out there, like, grabbing their hands. I think we might have engaged out with the other kids' hands, so it's okay. <laughs> but you know what? It's teaching them something. It's teaching them that it's okay. It's okay to worship God with some physical posturing. It's okay. It's biblical. Amen. This old ex-Baptist pastor <laughs> was brought up in, in I was brought up in some you know, legalistic teaching. I haven't kept that a secret. <laughs> Here I am in a non-denomination church, praise God. <laughs> and I was, but I was taught by modeling by my adults. I was taught by modeling by my adults that the that our worship was uncomfortable, so we don't do that. Wow. I was. That's, there, we got a lot of Baptists in here, Texas Baptists. There ain't anything I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, and, and, and some are a little more legalistic than others. Really? In 2 Samuel 6 14, I don't think you have that, brother. Remember, it says that David danced before the Lord. Do you remember the rest of the verse? With light. David danced before the Lord with all his might. I mean, we're watching our Marines. We're watching our Marines. I love that. Man, that was my faith. <laughs> that was a real, boy, that gets me excited. You know, just to see, we've got guys out there that we need to be praying for. They're fighting for your freedom. They're dying for your freedom. And just watching them modeling. I mean, I, I, oh, my goodness. I can't imagine some of those guys as fathers and how they're modeling for their children because they love Jesus. And they're sitting there as, you know, burning Marines that, you know, Green Berets or whatever, you know, and they're just, they're, they're praising the Lord. They're going, you know, motion, just, they're praising the Lord with all their might. Man. And that sounds like a passionate physical act of worship with David from a man that was after God's own heart. Like, maybe that's the question. Are you a man or a woman after God's own heart? As we're preparing to do something, to go somewhere where nobody has gone before. With this fasting, let God do what God's going to do. You know, we're talking
talking about worshiping. You know, we, we have those that says, you know, God knows my heart. God knows my heart, so he knows I worship him on the inside. I feel faith, so I don't need to risk anything because I understand what faith is, right? And so we kind of see what the big C church will teach when it comes, you know, to, to the feelings and, and our thinking, our stinking thinking, right? Yeah. In the modern church, it seems that everything gets reduced down to how we feel and what we think, and there's no outward manifestation. <coughs> and that's and again, that's how I was brought up. Boy, am I glad I go free of that. It is so freeing at a whole different level when there's that physical posturing, that biblical physical posturing, and you're praying, and you're developing a relationship with a God that is real and alive, and no other religion has a God that's real and alive but ours. Amen? Wow. So if you keep telling... You know, your wife or your husband that you love them, but you don't do anything to prove that, then it's only words. It's only words with no meaning. Get your wife's flowers this weekend, then. <laughs> Take them out. Get them chocolate. <laughs> Maybe start devotions. Maybe start having devotions with your wife. I like our relationship with God. With God, every year, I'm like, I can do better. I can do better, and I'm excited to do better. Can you do better with your relationship with your spouse? Absolutely. Absolutely. This isn't even a Valentine's message. <laughs> Sometimes God says to his people that he demands a physical act of obedience before he releases spiritual victory. And fasting is one of those acts of obedience. And I've received so much positive feedback from so many of you. And as I say, this gets me so excited. So when we're looking here at this physical posturing like Moses experienced that will release spiritual power, that will release spiritual favor, that will release spiritual help, that will release spiritual protection, that will release spiritual miracles, that will release spiritual blessings. I mean, we could be here all day listening, listening that. I know. I guess it's just asking how bad do we want it. Amen. Amen. Yep. Understand this, that we don't worship angels, because that's just foolish, Right? But it's also equally as foolish to ignore angels. Angels, good and bad, right? Yep. Are in the Bible. Therefore, they're real. And they require an understanding. We talked about some already with, with Daniel and with, with you know, what Moses is doing. You'll see the angels released there so they win the battle. But when you begin to fast and pray, you begin to release God's supernatural power and forces of heaven. And in my Christian walk, I have been learning that as I get more on fire for Christ and fall more in love with Him and seek to get closer to Him, that the attacks from the enemy will come. They will come. I expect them. And I've heard some say, I don't know if I want to get too close to God because then Satan will know who I am. And I don't want to solicit any trouble in my life. <laughs> well, think about that. That's fair, right? Right? That's fair. That's fair. Because now they're getting, that's, if you get to the beginning of that understanding, okay, just understand this. Satan already knows who you are. Yeah. Okay? But think of it this way. In the army, what ranks tend to receive more protection? A private or a five-star general? You know where I'm going with this. <laughs> the higher you are, the more angelic protection you will receive. And I've noticed that. Will the attacks come? They do. They still will come. He, he's not going to give up. He knows he's already he's fighting a losing battle. 
but he could still harvest souls to hell while he's fighting his losing battle. So the higher angelic participation with the assignment God gave you, the greater God trusts you with greater assignments. The greater the protection. Think about that. The greater assignment you have, the greater protection God will give. Fasting and praying? Man, hands down, when do you fast? Remember Elisha? When his servant went out and came back to Elisha and said, The Assyrians are surrounding us. What are we going to do? And Elisha said, Relax. And when he went out, when the servant went out and looked again, he saw a chariots, a horses, and fire protecting them. You know what? That brings up. I can't even remember, it doesn't even matter. A missionary that was telling us this amazing story. Can't remember who it was, can't remember where it was, doesn't matter. And he was out in a third world world country, I know that. And um, you know, we're talking like uh, like End of the Spirit. Anybody ever see that movie? Oh, check that movie out. End of the Spirit, true story. Missionaries, we went out to, again, don't remember the country, and uh, they, there were like four of them, and uh, they just wanted to convert these, uh, I can't remember the group of people, you, I'll call them you bangies, I don't know what they were, um, and they just wanted to just share Christ with them, and they no sooner got there, and they were savagely, no pun intended, murdered, and the burden of the souls didn't die because the burden was also in the wives of the missionaries. And the wives took up the task to go convert these Ubangis. Again, don't make them group of the people. Let's make it out. And uh, they went and long story short, these this group of third world country, you know, living in the jungle people came to know the Lord. They were so remorseful. They were so remorseful for what they had done. Killing your husbands of these women. Get the movie. End of the spirit. My point. The missionary that shared with us, um, he said that they were just starting to enter into the, the jungle land where the people were at, and they started coming out. That's why it reminded me of the movie. And they had, you know, we weapons, you know, it's very archaic type weapons, and they just didn't know what to do. <clears throat> So the missionary said to him and his group there, they just started praying. He said he fell on his knees and just started praying. And he said that he looked up and he saw on the outskirts. So he had them being attacked. He had the cannibals. And then there's another line of what looked like soldiers. And the cannibals saw them and ran. And he noted the time and everything. They didn't weren't killed. He noted the time and everything. He went back, and of course they were all just scared to death, but they still knew what their mission was. They went back and communicated with his prayer team back home, and he just was explaining everything that had just happened. And his prayer leader said, when did that happen? And he gave him the exact timeline stuff. He goes, that's the exact time that me and the prayer team was in our prayer room, on our knees, crying and weeping for your protection. And God sent soldiers. It's the only way they could explain it. To protect them. To protect them. you're calling, the bigger your protection. The higher the call and assignment on your life, the higher the divine protection on you and your family. Not just you. Yeah. You and your family. So don't be afraid. When you're fasting, as we wrap things up here, when you're fasting, don't be afraid to ask big. You hear me? Don't be afraid to ask big. I've been there, done that. And I was putting up my food in place real quick. Don't you dare be afraid to ask big. He's a lot bigger. Amen. 
Don't you be afraid to believe big. Don't you dare back down because you're afraid the enemy is going to fight you more if you keep doing more. Don't you dare. Because I'll tell you one person I don't want turning on me, and that's my Lord. And I've had chastening happen. And that's not fun. Because when chastening happens, you will know in your heart, because the Holy Spirit will tell you, that you aren't obeying God. You're not doing what you're told. And I'm going to keep chasing you until you do. And that's why I finally submitted to the call of Christ. Because I was resisting. Some of you know my story. But you only know half of it. <laughs> Someday I'll tell you all of it. God's church, Impact Life Church, is just getting started. If the Lord tarries, His church is just getting started, and we're going to be receiving more angelic protection as we faithfully obey what God needs us to do. And there's something about that physical obedience that will release that spiritual victory. Amen? Amen. Yeah. It's less of us and more of Him. Less of us and more of Him. Why God say that in your head today? Less of me, more of He. Amen? Less of me, more of He. Some people can only remember if put around to it. Because then you go out and you get distracted. So as we close this morning, let me dissect something that Gabriel said to Daniel as Gabriel was the messenger for God. We saw it last week. I didn't dissect it last week because God wanted it to be brought out this week. Sorry, brother. Daniel chapter 10, verse 11. And then next we're going to jump to Jan Daniel chapter 10, verse 19. But look at Daniel 10, verse 11. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved. Go to Daniel chapter 10, verse 19, brother. And he said, O man greatly beloved. Gabriel didn't say that because he loved him. Gabriel was the messenger. So, Jim, are you greatly beloved by your Lord? You absolutely are. Rich, you greatly beloved, brother, by your Lord? <laughs> yeah. You sure are, buddy. Levi, you greatly beloved? Think about that. The messenger was saying to the man that was praying and fasting, looking for an answer to what this vision was, along with other things he was praying for, because he wanted to be closer to God. Are we dearly beloved? I'm not going to say one word. I'm just going to pose. Yeah. You were dearly You are dearly beloved. More than you will ever understand. Fasting and praying is the least that we can do for our Lord and our Savior without any excuses as we have our guide now. We can see we can fast and pray in ways that, that we are depriving ourselves so we're aware. Right? And you also know now the gauge that is, is if you're not if you're not being forced to think about praying when you're fasting, then you're not doing it right. And I had a conversation with somebody this week, and I'm not even going to say who it was, but he was fasting. He was fasting. He was fasting. Right for a breakthrough. Wait for a breakthrough. Wait for a breakthrough. And we just took a couple texts, and I said, are you afraid? And he said, Oh, that's the part that's missing. <laughs> yeah. Fasting and praying. I love you, brother. <laughs> you got to do them both. They go hand in hand. Yep. They go hand in hand. Let's stand this morning. Let's stand this morning. Let's prepare ourselves. February 20th is going to be here in two weeks. Let's prepare.